Fresh Economic Thinking podcast. New ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. Has a book ever completely changed your view on the economic and political world? Jonathan told me he read Emmanuel Wallerstein, and that's what happened. I was intrigued. I'd never heard of this character, so today we're going to find out all about that story. And the best place to start might be to find out who Wallerstein is and how you stumbled across him. Jonathan? Well, subheading of this episode, uh, The Terminal Crisis of Capitalism. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I, when I was at uni as an undergrad, I read an anthropology textbook um, and uh, there were they, they said there were two ways to understand a culture. There was the emic approach, which is the, the insider's mm-hmm. perspective, which looks at the beliefs and the values and the practices from someone who lives inside that culture. And then there's the etic approach, E-T-I-C, which is the outsider's perspective. So someone looking at it from the outside, looking at trying to understand behaviors in terms of functional or evolutionary significance. And the textbook gave some examples from the literature, including a statement that went something like, For an etic perspective on the contemporary capitalist world economy, see Emmanuel Wallerstein and a series of citations. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) and um, I was hungry for exactly that. I wanted to pull back the curtain on the world economy. I wanted to see the Wizard of Oz pulling the levers, as you know, any young radical student does. Um, And I wasn't disappointed. Um, So tell me, you weren't disappointed with Wallerstein's view as an etic analyst funny who is he anyway (laughs) all right so wallerstein who passed away at the age of 88 in 2019 he was the pioneer of what's originally uh, an explicitly leftist or even marxist school of thought in political economy it's called world systems analysis Mm -hmm. it's all like coined by him of course and he's had a bit of an empire in academia with followers and acolytes um And by Marxist, I don't mean like woke cultural left stuff that Jordan Peterson uses the word to mean. I actually mean what it really means, like old left historical materialist. I mean, a way of looking at the world that follows the money. Yeah. Uh Um, So we're only going to scratch the surface of his thought in this episode, but um, there's really a lot to read if you get into Wallerstein. And he challenges a a lot of sacred cows and gets into some really interesting territory. Well, okay. So... Wallerstein is in the same generation as that other great New York Jewish leftist, Noam Chomsky. And if Mm. Wallerstein was a a different personality, he might have been a rock star intellectual like Chomsky. Um, The difference in personal style between the two is quite stark. I mean, Chomsky, who is now 94 years old, uh, is very moralistic and very kind of preachy and very ground level in the subject matter he focuses on. and, And that really makes him a thought leader for activists. Uh-huh. Um, in contrast, though, Wallerstein is very remote as a thinker and much more confined to the halls of academia. Uh, he did participate in things like the World Social Forum, but his personal style is uh, a bit cold, you know, probably more known in France than in the US. Um, and, and, and where was very, he from? What's where's From New York, from New York in- City, yeah. Career at Columbia University, yeah. Okay. Uh, Very God's eye view. When people challenge him on anything more, like on anything to do with his narrative, more often than not, the reply is, well, you think that because you're looking at the last five or 10 years in your country or in a bunch of countries you're familiar with, but you're failing to see the big picture over the whole world over 200, 300 years, yeah? (laughs) That's basically what he says, Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know that I don't know you have do you have that sense of exhilaration and awe when you hear from an astronomer or a physicist talk about like the lifespan of the galaxy or how stars and planets evolve? Like do you do you when yeah. you watch a documentary? Yeah, I, I do like that zoomed out perspective at times and just putting your small day to day arguments. You know, I'm going to argue about superannuation or housing supply or whatever it is that seems like a big deal and a huge policy question. And then you just zoom out either in time over more than, you know, the last 50 years, go to 100, it changes, go to 200, it's radically different. Um, And in space, you know, if you look around the world, you just start thinking, ah, well, you know, how important is 
you know, Australia's superannuation system and its fees pretty irrelevant um, yeah. in this big picture. So I do like doing that from time to time. So I, he sounds like a kind of guy I should start reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I get that's the exhilaration I get from reading Emmanuel Wallerstein. And, and it's a shame he didn't have the drive to popularise his ideas in like r- more best-selling kinds of books, like, you know, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, um, I did like that book. And so I do... I do feel like a part of the job for scientists is to communicate these ideas. I, I really do feel like it's intimately linked. There's no point having an idea in, in your garage, discovering something and not telling anyone. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that Sapiens is a good book for that zoomed out perspective for anyone who hasn't read it. Yeah. In fact, Wallerstein's eerily like, uh, you know, I've been watching the Isaac Asimov Sci-Fi Foundation um, oh, yeah, okay. s- TV series. I mean, I've read the Foundation novels as a as a teenager. Wallerstein is eerily like the Harry Seldon character in those novels, a scientist who kind of develops this grand system of thought to explain how societies throughout the galaxy change over really long periods of time, and he can predict long-term trends and stuff. Anyway, I just, just a thought there. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, um, including the collapse of the Galactic Empire, which is also yeah. relevant. So, so you, how did how did Wallerstein then shape your thoughts besides um, seeing parallels in the in the mm-hmm. movies? Mm-hmm. All right, let's what, go. What were the big? Let's thoughts? get into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk about his world systems analysis. That's world systems with a plural and with a hyphen. For the last four decades, Wallerstein was basically saying that capitalism as a historical system um, had its period of growth, its stable functioning, and now its terminal crisis. And he was very consistent. He didn't really change his story over four decades. What is capitalism for Wallerstein? It's a historical system. It's not something abstract. So he was a historian. And okay. his his history started in North, in the corner of Northwestern Europe in the 16th century. His you know, it's a system. What what is it? It's it's not the free market. It's a system where the accumulation of capital, so making money, is a pursuit that goes from the margins, um, as it has historically been throughout human history, to being the number one priority. Mm. And the people who engage in profit-seeking activities go from being a highly controlled group at the bottom of the social hierarchy to being the most powerful group at the top of the social hierarchy. You know, it's a system where these people, and let's call them generously entrepreneurs, they uh-huh. use governments to help them construct monopolies. And these monopolies are eroded over time and they become less profitable over time such that entrepreneurs have to continually seek to create new monopolies in new leading edge sectors. And this dynamic leads to uh, a, a series of processes and it led to European expansion across the globe yep. and to the construction of a kind of stable division of labor in the world between the core zone of the world economy, a peripheral zone of the world economy, and a kind of in-between semi-peripheral zone. And these zones do different types of things. And that drives what kind of state structures, what kind of governments exist in each of these zones, strong states in core zones and weak states in peripheral zones, and what kind of societies and what kind of cultural values and life experiences people have in each of these three zones. Okay, so, so let me just see if I've got it clear. The rise of exchange and profit within society from being a niche activity of, for example, fur traders, gold traders, people, you know, trading what couldn't be produced locally uh, for profit, um, where where local society is still run by what, like family and religious order? rather than commercial order is that yep. what <laughs> yeah kind of i mean historically every gr- every agricultural civilization the, the kings the princes the feudal lords were keeping merchants under very tight control they uh-huh. were a destabilizing force you don't want uh-huh. people running around trying to make money everywhere that makes life very chaotic because you know you don't want people who th- who who think they can rise above their station right uh-huh. um so what you want is you want to just keep these things under very tight control. And just the uh-huh. whole logic of accumulating capital just for its own sake, uh-huh. that was a completely foreign concept for 99% of you know human <laughs> existence. Like in, in traditional societies, you give away money because that that it makes you grand or that makes you respected by the gods. Um, that gives you honor 
you know, okay. like the idea of accumulating money and keeping it for yourself and reinvesting it so you can do more of the same activity and make more money and so you can make, you know, sell more stuff and make more. That is just completely irrational by the standards of 99% of human existence. <laughs> you think, though, well, so before we get on, I want to get on to this periphery and this cycles part of the story, but does, does um, Wallerstein say what whether this is good or bad because the economists would say um and i think yuval noah harari in sapiens also implies this when he says the thing that created economic growth was the belief that we can have growth and once you believe you can then these commercial incentives operate and you're like well if we invest we'll have more customers and people will get things that they want and then when they spend money we can invest and get even richer so it's like this self-reinforcing cycle that is actually quite beneficial compared to a cycle where you're giving away money for honor you're making sacrifices and it might be stable and ordered these feudal arrangements but it doesn't have that um, growth imperative does does wallerstein you're right that? it doesn't have the growth imperative and you know i'll i'll say like many marxists they they have a view on how feudalism and wallerstein does have a view on how feudalism transitioned into capitalism many mm -hmm. debates many historical debates around that basically feudal lords uh, for for many many reasons some of it to do with the particular circumstances of europe in the 13th 14th 15th centuries um found themselves in a situation where they had no choice but you know what i mean like it was accidental conjuncture of circumstances that led to this profit seeking um mm -hmm. idea to sort of become the dominant logic of the society and it was po the politically fractured nature of europe is often cited as being a reason why that took off you know that that merchants were able to basically play states off one against the other and they and they each needed each other and once the dynamic got going it was very hard to stop because it has a very destabilizing effect um the, 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 there are some there are big big issues there that we probably can't deal with here so i'm gonna try to maybe limit our chat okay. or our our debate a bit to more yeah. on the the crisis that he talks about because it's more like future oriented rather than a historical oh, okay. debate so tell me what he thinks the crisis will be yeah. and so uh, yeah. yeah maybe you go there but i'm also curious about this why it's called world systems his approach yeah, world systems. So okay. he basically, we... like, although he's a historian, he's also he builds his history into a with a he sort of combines it with a really powerful explanatory uh, framework, and that is the the long term business cycles that maybe if, you know economists are familiar with. Yeah. They're called Kondratiev cycles, and he really latches onto those Kondratiev cycles, which are kind of sixty to maybe I, I don't know, I can't remember exactly sixty to eighty year upswings and downswings in world economic you know activity um remember his unit of analysis is always the world not any individual country so first you know the all the world mm -hmm. system i should say so in the 16th century he starts by analyzing the netherlands and, and then it expands outwards and outwards and outwards and outwards and then you know the uk and the rest of europe and eastern europe gets incorporated into the world system and then north africa and then the middle east and by the end of the 19th century the whole globe is part of the capitalist world economy so um uh -huh. That's his unit of analysis. So he does latch onto the Kondratiev cycle as like the the sort of regular rhythm or the cyclical rhythm that drives the capitalist world economy over those hundreds of years. So maybe um, we should pause there because that's not a core economic idea. I think that's mm -hmm. a Kondratiev. Well, who who is this? I assume it's named after a person. These a are Russian just... economists. Yep. This is yep. just a name for long cycles of growth and contraction in correct yeah in sort of the world in general or in capitalist societies because there is some kind of internal incentive in the system which which would it it's be? a business cycle basically but a but a you know a long, long scale one okay. yeah and do, and where are we now in 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 people who are kondrative followers i don't know i don't know okay when he another when he died, another topic he was, another yeah. another <laughs> yeah. recording okay when, when, when he died he was saying we were we were starting another upswing but look the problem okay. with wallerstein and i will say that as this is a follower is okay. that anything you anything he says like he, he is explicitly 
a, a he's doing an intellectual protest against the status quo, right? He okay. is he's got a narrative and he doesn't really deviate from it. You can ask him any question you want and he'll always bring it back to his story. And his story has a lot of evidence behind it. He's very confident in asserting certain things like we're at the beginning of a Kondratiev upswing or, you know, the pri- or something he says is like the, the most profitable activities now are nothing compared to how profitable they were 200 years ago. Like he says, Microsoft and Amazon, their rate of profit is nothing if you compare it in relative terms to standard oil. And I, and I know, realize now that that's, there are very few people in the world that have the expert knowledge to debate that. The, the 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 figures between hundreds of years are very hard to yeah to, to mount an argument it's, in favor or against it but he's yeah he's that's using, pretty hard to um yeah that's a tough argument a hundred you know, billion dollars is today is still a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> but I think the key thing to know about Wallace Dunn is he's a political uh, and a cultural analyst as well as an economic analyst so he's got he's got a political barrow right. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to read more. But one thing you said just before, Jonathan, was uh, the periphery versus the core. Why is that a big deal? Are we not seeing that um, what used to be periphery countries becoming very successful? We have the whole, all the Asian tigers becoming becoming rich and, and having their own cores? Or well, I don't really get how does he differentiate and why are those concepts important? Yeah, it's it's a relative concept. So some zones of some some geographies will go up, like East Asia, in recent decades, and some will go down. Um, it just depends who's successful, which states are successful at grabbing, working with capitalists, or directing the activities of capitalists to the most high profit activities, the most leading leading edge sectors of the world economy at that moment. Uh, the point is, it's a relative thing. Not everyone can be making, um, you know, computer chips and high-end machine tools in you know, high-end manufacturing. Someone has to grow bananas and do mining. And so it's a relative thing. P- countries go up and down. If you're fortunate, you live in a country that is going up. If you're unlucky, you live in one that's going down. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a stable tripartite division there um, structurally. It's it moves around though, so that's that's the concept. Uh, I don't think that's particularly unique to him. You you mentioned that you teach different theories of development, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of theories of development that talk about unequal exchange, how uh, the poorer countries in the world economy are kind of locked into this. It's very very difficult for those poorer countries to go up the ladder. That's right. So the the general puzzle in economics it's called convergence. Or, and the question is, well, if there are uh, at some point diseconomies of scale, once you've got, you know, lots of ports and trains and airports and factories and stuff, you know, adding the next one doesn't really help you radically improve what you're doing. It's a little bit like, you know, the de- marginal, declining marginal benefits. You know, you eat the first slice of pizza, you're really happy. Your next slice, you're like, oh, the th- 10th slice it's not really helping you and so the rich countries are already nine slices in to their economic growth so the question is well why aren't the poor countries catching up because their first slice of pizza catches them up really quick their first you know airport factory whatever um, can really help so the big puzzle in economics is why isn't there convergence why aren't poor countries catching up and so there's there's a huge debate because some countries did. So they're like, well, there's some conditional convergence. And the question is, what are the conditions <laughs> to make some countries rich? So, so there's plenty of similar uh, debates in economics. There's plenty of theories of growth, like long-run growth from agricultural to industrial to commercial. There's plenty of um, theories of growth that, that suggest that uh, you know, in finance, there's this joke that all large businesses ultimately become banks, which is essentially saying um, to to grow early, you have to innovate and do something new. But once you become a big, stable business, you're better off just being a cozy monopoly, lending people money, <laughs> sitting on land and property. Um, 
yeah and, and sort of collecting exactly. your political rents um but the economists are like well that's fine as long as there's some competition at the other end for new startups yeah um, so I, and i understand wallerstein sort of sees the world as this monopoly uh, rent seeking behavior as well is that right yeah i mean and i think they teach this at business schools maybe less so that the, in classic neoclassical economics but like you know why is apple able to be as profitable as it is it's because it invented something new like it's obvious like it's the it's got a monopoly on this new technology it's the only one selling this amazing thing right it's obvious yeah. so and then over time different companies in china and wherever they're going to copy and there's going to be competing products that are kind of similar and then the, you know they're going to have to compete and the prices will come down and then you know, and then there'll be something new and Apple will go down the ladder in terms of who's profitable. Maybe the next thing is the AI companies are going to be the the ones at the top of the tree. Once upon a time, textiles were high profit 500 yeah. years ago. Now everyone makes T-shirts and it's nothing. You can't make any serious money on, on T-shirts. So I think business schools probably do a better job of this than, I don't know, you can tell yeah. me. So, Jonathan, as a fan of Wallerstein... Um, can you maybe just reflect for me? I'm I'm curious to know how your thinking has changed having read this person's uh, zoomed out view of the world and their theory of you know, the economy from this view, the ethic approach. So, for example, if you could tell your um, go in a time machine and tell yourself pre Wallerstein some insight uh, about you know how you would be a different thinker in the future, what, what's the main thing do you see or do you think maybe is it just the ability to zoom out and look at the system as a whole well there are many eye-opening things about wallerstein's um, world systems approach and the first is the idea of capitalism not as a free market but as a system comprised of capitalists and the interstate system government governments who use okay. each other and the concept that capitalists actually run away from a free market and spend all their time trying to create relative monopolies with the aid of government power that was something that was completely different from what i was being told in the media and by economists about how things work so i was like yeah. right you know this actually does accord with reality it when i look around the world this is actually how it works <laughs> You know, look, so. yeah, you're so you're so right. Um, so I think people get a warped view, um, a warped view of economics because the press ec economists are all sort of employed by businesses who have to talk about how free markets are great, but the academic economists are very aware that no comp no business loves competition, right? <laughs> You make money by monopolizing things. And so the real sort of capitalist debates are about how do we monopolize more stuff to get our share? And the economist sort of says, well, as long as we limit the ability to do that, we'll get some competition. So there's this constant battle between using capitalism for, for its innovative and ins competitive incentives and the incentives internal to the system of just getting bigger and fatter monopolies and and avoiding competition. So that's very much a central part of economics. And obviously my PhD was on rent seeking and political favoritism, which is sort of on the ground, how that happens. But you're right. Like it's not well understood broadly, I think. And you you need someone like Wallerstein or, or somebody, and maybe I should write more on fresh economic thinking about um, this, this battle for, for rents through political decisions but yeah no that's clearly a big um shift in perspective so it's, it's interesting to hear that this is how you went through that shift and i went through a similar shift through my um master's and phd degrees very interesting interesting yeah um yeah i would say that he's got a very in like a very unique political account of the last 500 years so he would say mm -hmm. There, there, there were always anti-systemic forces in the capitalist world economy. Um, and his What's most anti-systemic force. Yeah. To... So, well, let's talk about the anti-systemic forces of the last 200 years. So okay. the communist parties, the socialist parties, and the social democratic parties, these movements that said to people, join us, work with us, we're going to take state power, we're going to achieve state power, and we're going to transform the system. 
and we're going to transform the system in a direction of equality and justice and a better world. Vote with us, work with us, fight with us. Paradise is on the horizon, <laughs> right? Yeah. And paradoxically, he says, paradoxically, the fact that they were successful, they all came to power pretty much, if, even if they didn't, as parties come to power in every single country, their ideas came to power in the post-1945 world, so 1945 to 1970, uh -huh. let's say. The fact that they, they, what they did was throughout the period of fighting and then achieving state power is they disciplined the working classes. They disciplined uh -huh. poor people throughout the world system. Uh -huh. They said, patience, 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 have patience, work with us, we're getting there. And what they did was they actually tamed Yeah. Uh, working classes and what happened was when they achieved state power they said okay now we're going to do everything and you know what they kind of didn't they yeah. they made some changes and of course in some parts of the world including our own the economic status of working class people absolutely did improve you know you look at europe america yeah. australia absolutely it improved but compared to what they promised the world they yeah. wanted to build and this gets into the history of socialist and communist movements. What yeah. the, all this energy actually achieved very little. And that's because uh -huh. he says the system was in a stable state. Like in the end, what did the Soviet Union end up doing? It ended up being a state capitalist country. It ended up just saying, no, no, we're going to achieve development and capital accumulation better than you because we've got this different way of doing things internally. Uh -huh. Uh, you know that that's essentially like they abandoned all the transformative things that they wanted to do originally in 1917 and it mm -hmm. just became another version of capitalist development that's that's the wildstein account of course i'm sure there are many people around the world who disagree with that and look i want to say just up front my grandparents were in the gulags i know exactly the <laughs> of you look at it from an economics perspective on it anyway. so at the end of the day though uh so you you've learned this rent seeking is core to to everything and that um that the promise for workers to organize often led to their own sort of discipline and repression um yep. okay yeah so that's super interesting but he also says there's what crises coming there's a terminal crisis Exactly. Tell me, As, tell me where yeah. we end up with Wallerstein. So he <laughs> says, like historical systems of which capitalism is one, <laughs> yeah, have their their birth, their stable functioning, and their decline and death. And we are in the terminal crisis of capitalism now. So what does he say? He says there are some secular trends, not business cycles, but actual historical trends that are not reversible, that are leading to a crisis of mm -hmm. functioning of the capitalist system and that's going to lead to chaos and craziness and bifurcation and and a period of time and this is the hopeful part a period of time in which uh, we all as individuals and as you know as as groups we have a lot of power to change things because the system's so unstable that a small push yeah. in one direction or another can really have a big impact so yeah. that's 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 interesting so let's get let's get into them the fact the first factor he talks about is that the real wage level as a percentage of cost of production is going up because why capitalism is actually losing it's 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 exhausted the last armies or is about or is currently exhausting the last reserve armies of cheap and compliant labor in the world economy so what oh, has capitalism done over 500 years it's continuously moving peasants people in rural areas to work in factories or to work in enterprises in cities and they come in and for them working at very very low wages is actually a real plus it's actually an improvement mm -hmm. for them and then after a few decades they learn they get their bearings they learn how to operate they start demanding higher wages they start to organize they, you know, they want, they demand, you know, their life conditions improve. And then the capitalists start going, hmm, okay, we better look for somewhere else. And then they find <laughs> you know, was China. Now yeah. we know that our t-shirts no longer say made in China. We now see our t-shirts are made in Vietnam or made in Bangladesh. Well, where are yeah. they going to go after Bangladesh? There are no more pe rural pools of labor to draw on. That's what Wallerstein's saying. So they've exhausted the mechanism that they always use, the capitalists, to bring in people at very low wages mm -hmm. and to continue the process. 
Okay. So that's number one. Do you, oh, do you have a view on that? Like, do you think de uh, I think you'd be surprised that there's still plenty of poor people around the world. So I, I don't know if this is an imminent change. But The question um, is not whether there are a lot of poor people around the world. The question is whether there are a lot of poor people who don't know how to organize, who oh, okay, will okay. accept for many decades oh, okay. you know, very low wages. Yeah? Right, so, right, and right. And here's an interesting concept he draws on, which is proletariat the idea of being a proletarian, which is like a concept from socialism and communism, right? What does it mean? It means someone who relies entirely on wages for their subsistence. Yeah. Yeah. What capitalists like is they like they like to have workers who are not fully reliant on wages. They like to have workers who can go back to the village and sustain themselves from the livestock and the stuff they grow. And the wages are just a top up. They like that because they'll accept really low wages. Yeah. Okay. And what capitalists don't want is workers who rely entirely on wages and they have no choice but to start demanding an improvement yeah Yeah, exactly start organizing yeah Uh yeah Yeah, i mean this all makes sense right like um i often think of you know housewives of wealthy doctors do lots of voluntary work they don't need wages to get up right because they're they're supported externally but so they can go and volunteer you know working I don't know, as a as a nurse for some old people. But if you're a nurse professionally, um, you need wages, right? Because you've got to support your own family from doing that task. So you've got to join the union and get organized, right? Exactly. Um, so so that's sort of your point with a modern example. Although I, I'm still a little torn about that uh-huh. because economists would say, you know, this, this is the whole idea of little capitalists, right? If, if everyone owns their home, they like the price of assets going up. If everyone has a super account, we like companies making more profits. But isn't there a tension between profits and wages? So um, oh, maybe, uh, yeah. okay, I'm going to think about this. I really like that point. You got me thinking. It, it- <laughs> it's something that maybe, like for for our world, the world with which we are familiar, this is something that disappeared a hundred years ago, right? But it's still the case yeah. in many countries, including where I spend a bit of time in Thailand. You uh-huh. get people who are willing to accept very low wages for certain jobs because they go back to their village and they have the land, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, right. so we're running out of... Poor people so who are running out of poor who will accept wages. So that's yeah. some kind of that's one, inevitable That's a ending. profit squeeze. Profit uh-huh. squeeze. Okay, Got second it. factor. Uh, the ecological crisis is forcing the internalization of the environmental costs of production, which is fatal to profitability. Now, of course, everyone will say, oh, yeah, but there's still companies dumping stuff in the river. But, of course, the answer Wallerstein always gives to everything is, yeah, you think that, but look over historical time, the number of places where that's allowed is dropping very quickly. Uh, <laughs> even in China, where they prioritize development over everything else, they're like, no, nope, oh, yeah, factories, you've got to impose this new technology on your stacks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're not going to allow you to dump this stuff in the river anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, well, economists have it uh, also, yeah, that's well understood as well. We call that sort of the inverted, uh, the, the U shape of, of development once we, be, we 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 sacrifice the environment to become richer but once we get rich we want environmental amenities so we invest in them so, so that's a not that's for him that's a, a profit squeeze that's oh that's a okay Wallace, that's it. a wallerstein Got profit squeeze the Got third it. thing the democratization this gets into the political side of things the uh-huh. democratization of the world is producing worldwide demands for decent and secure income educate primarily we're talking health care and education and pensions None of which capitalism can afford to provide on a global scale without squeezing profits in a terminal manner. Um, So when he says democratization, he just means the demands that people have that the socialist and communist and other anti-systemic movements always promised to deliver but didn't. And now the loss of faith in state structures as vehicles for people's betterment the loss of faith in those movements, the loss of faith in governments as a whole has actually led to people not being patient, not being disciplined, just saying, no, we want healthcare, education, pensions, etc. We want a decent life. They scream about, you know, when the cost of living goes up and governments are under pressure to spend to help them. <laughs> and uh-huh. um, that's what he's saying is another terminal profit squeeze. Because they can only do it by taxing. 
my 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 economic spidey senses are, are up on those three so you've got a profit squeeze from workers running out of disorganized poor workers a profit squeeze from internalizing environmental externalities and profit squeeze from demands for health okay yeah. but why is that a profit squeeze like if i mean you know if you are selling um x-ray and ct machines you're going to make heaps of money if there's an expansion of health well i think it and comes if down you to are taxation selling, yeah but that i mean it's all just redistribution right at the end of the day um you can redistribute and be very profitable i mean apple exists no you know, but like the the big capitalists don't want like they don't want to be charged 30 percent tax that's why they're all domiciled in i don't know the bahamas or whatever they of course each individual doesn't but as a system as a whole it, it doesn't really matter so but if, much but right? if taxes are taxing. ratcheting up constantly but they there's with it but this is the thing i think this is for a guy who thinks world system you know my spidey senses tell me he's missing the fact that a tax doesn't just suck stuff out of the system it just no but it sucks stuff out of profits for the capitalists but it puts it back in to be respent so the money keeps it doesn't matter but the capitalists don't care about the money going around they need their profits like but the that is part of their care. profits profits are part of it the more the more money you know what i'm saying like a dollar can oh, go you around mean like around people will buy their products and okay well so i don't you, have the... you offer you tax me and you build a hospital right yeah. there's plenty of profits in a public hospital to be made on construction on materials on machines on being a doctor uh <laughs> you know, on, on all sorts of things. And then those people take their profits and then they pay taxes and then it goes back to spending on the hospital, which comes back. Like, I feel like there's a the macroeconomic insight that you know, money circulates is somewhat missing a little, but I'm going to have to read him more now. Like, yeah, look, I don't know how to answer that. Like, okay. I don't know. But like, if you think about it, why, do, like, to me, it makes sense simply because I think like, well, why did, why does big business or all business resist tax? Why do they scream whenever any government says, oh, we're going to raise taxes? Well, everybody who well, pays a reason. screams, everyone who benefits doesn't scream. Like it's just self-interested yeah, exactly. behavior. Like they, Exactly. Any... So why is it so, but you're saying, oh, no, but if they were really self-interested, no, no, they no. wouldn't resist so much. No, no, no. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is um, within a system as a whole, you yeah. can change taxes and change redistribution such that the benefits and costs are borne differently and so everybody wants someone else to bear the costs while they get the benefits but collectively the costs and benefits will all add up to the same amount so it's like an internal argument about you should you should tax um toyota not mazda of course like you know why wouldn't mazda argue that toyota's especially unique and you should tax them and not not us but collectively the fact that there is a tax doesn't change the collective profits of every car maker. It de decreases Toyota's, increases Mazda's, right? But that's not changing like capitalist profits. Yeah. It's but just that's a not how capitalism works. Each capitalist works. is in a is in a fight for the, for themselves. They're yeah, not exactly. acting as a group collectively. And also, there's a class struggle element. They want, oh. they don't, you know, they they want people at the bottom to be at the bottom. They don't want people to have comfortable lives, so they don't have to accept low-paying jobs. They don't want, you know, welfare states to provide them with, you know, incomes such that they don't need to work at low wages at a Toyota factory. They don't want that. But but here we are. That doesn't that just contradict the other point? Like, if the welfare state provides people incomes. Then they'll accept lower wages because that's an that's just like owning your own land. No, and they your won't. Own Not system. lower wages at really horrible jobs that no one wants to do. But it wasn't his previous point though that um, if you have your own capital, your own farm, and your own income source from that, then you won't organize to demand higher wages. Yeah, that's in and a situation. So if you have your you own are. income source that puts money in your bank account and it comes from, you know, uh, the treasury, then should you not organize you wouldn't organize for higher wages isn't that the same thing i think he's, <laughs> like the first point is about like a peasant in a very poor country with no options as opposed to yeah. as opposed to someone you know you know in an environment where they have options 
And Do they have options? I don't know. They only have options. Well, if the they social have their welfare. Own if you're in a Nordic welfare state, that yeah. gives you options. It cushions you from the market. So does that also then reduce pressure to raise wages? Oh, I gotta, I gotta read this guy because I feel like <laughs> on the on the tax point, for example, like yeah. corporates don't mind taxes if they get the benefit of them, right? Yeah, sure. They've they've never argued about getting subsidized, right? As long as someone else pays the tax to give them the subsidy. So they don't mind taxes and distribution. It's just that internal selfish fight over how it's being distributed at the moment. So anyway, so there's these three forces he thinks are at play. What happens after this? These forces uproot capitalism or do they not? Yeah, the ultimate fatal threat to capitalism doesn't come in, in Wallerstein's view from an impoverished population or an economic crisis, but actually from the demands of people for a better life um, that have been spawned, like these demands come from the culture that was spawned by capitalism in the first place. Um, okay. So it's a geoculture, he calls it, the geoculture of liberalism spawned by the French Revolution, and we don't mm-hmm. have really a lot of time to go into that. Um, <laughs> so when you're in a structural crisis, you can achieve a lot with relatively less effort. So he said, so basically he's, he says, you know, that the, act, the activism, the political organizing, even the founding of a fresh economic thinking think tank can have a big impact in this really unstable uh, um, st- state of the world in which we find ourselves, in which the system finds itself. Um, and, and so what would come after this uh, unstable period? You know, yeah, we have unstable periods, say- we fight each other, and then we reorganize into a similar looking, <laughs> like I think there's some... Yeah, well- hard truths about how humans organize their hierarchies and and what exactly. as you said the, the the communist workers um organized and got essentially the same capitalist power against them and they wages were low and investment yep. was low yeah and wallerstein used to say the socialist mantra he back like in his early 70s writings he used to say there's going to be an inevitable transition to a socialist world government but then later after the collapse of communism his writings were became what he stuck to for the rest of his life which was that the the result of the crisis of capitalism is inherently unknowable there's going to be a struggle between people who want to maintain their privilege and their power and those who want a more democratic more egalitarian world and the outcome of that struggle we don't know we don't know what it's going to be and it could be that What comes after capitalism, if the people who want to preserve their privilege and their power succeed, what comes after capitalism is going to be worse than capitalism. Um, It could be something neo-feudal and tech, tech, you know, based on some surveillance technology, whatever. And he never went into it, but that's me thinking about what could be worse than capitalism. And on the other hand, we could come up with a new system of governance that enables a redistribution of wealth um, internationally and, um, you know, a better world. I, it sets my framework for how I would like to struggle for a better world. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I remember some pretty amusing encounters that mainstream journalists had with Wallerstein trying to interview him and getting pretty frustrated. I I heard you interviewed him. Is that right? I did. Yeah. What? When was this? Tell, Tell us about that. And then the frustrations that others had. I interviewed him when I was a volunteer, a student volunteer at Radio 2 SER at, at UTS in Sydney. Um, I, I actually just really, really wanted to interview him. And I said to them, I'll pay for the phone call. And at that time, a phone call to Paris where he was that would have lasted 45 minutes probably would have cost about $30. And I said, I'll pay $30, you know, and they let me do it. And and, and it went to air. Um, not riveting radio, I must say. He just he just gives his narrative. He gives his lecture. He doesn't really, he doesn't really, he's not very interactive, shall we say. Um, uh-huh. I remember some pretty amusing encounters though, like Radio New Zealand comes to yeah. mind, like, cause he used to travel the world, you know, with all these sociology conferences and they interviewed him and there was this woman was trying to get him to comment on a current crisis. I don't remember what it was, like a current protest moment. Was it like anti-globalization movement or something? And he just was always reframing the question and saying, well, that's part of a very long story. The crisis you're talking about is like nothing. I'm talking about 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, 
Um, if anyone wants to look up Wallerstein on YouTube, the first thing that came up for me was an interview on Russia Today from the, the TV network from 12 years ago. And it was actually pretty good. Like the journalist, okay. she did a pretty good job handling him and talking about you know, Occupy Wall Street or whatever it was at the time. And, and, you know, he maybe he got better with media, but definitely a system thinker, not inspirational, not there an activist. <laughs> Got it. Well, it was good to hear at least how he cha- you know, enhanced your view of the world in ways that I, you know, that, that also makes sense to me in terms of the rent seeking, the monopolist, the, the the class competition, all those sorts of things. I think we're going to have to talk again about Kondrative cycles. Is that what they're called? And these long cycles, because I actually know we had Catherine Cashmore on. I remember uh, we spoke to her a while ago and she's a very much a follower of the business cycle and these long Kondrative cycles so maybe we should have a discussion about that as well and see if she's read <laughs> any wall of stuff mate i'm it's uh, yeah. i'm gonna have to um look at that youtube video i think and, and dig into this some more is there is there anything yeah. you would recommend maybe for our listeners if they if they want to dig into this this guy a little just, bit more just go to amazon and buy some books i guess i, I mean just, you can get some of the polemic stuff that's more recent. You can you can find his columns um, towards the end of his life online yep. um, at, through Yale's. I think through Yale, he he published some uh, regularly, like maybe once a week. So he was very much a bit of a bit of a, you know he had his followers and acolytes, and you know so he had his his website. But if you want the kind of history with drawings and maps and yeah. you know like early modern Europe and like where footnotes take up more than half the page, you go to the go to his magnum opus, the Modern World System, volumes one through four. Okay. Got the time. <laughs> let's let's wrap it up there for our listeners. The magnum opus, the World Systems one to four. Go and read it. <laughs> uh, leave a leave a comment when you have. Yeah. Great to talk, Jonathan. Let's talk again soon. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you.